But well, we began last, last week looking at, um, at basic uh, truths of the Christian faith, um, Christian basics as I'm calling it, looking at it um, in a general sense, but also a little bit from a, a, a brethren perspective, if you will. Uh, not giving brethren history as such, but just where, where maybe there's some particular <coughs> angle with which the brethren have, have looked at that, at that idea, that concept, that theme, that topic historically or today to kind of bring that to bear a little bit as, as well. And we began last week with the very foundational question of how do we know things? And you may remember, or maybe it just kind of went over your head, and, um, uh, but I'm going to try to rem remind you this morning, and if, if you weren't here, then that brings you up to speed with, with what we covered last week. Um, really, there are, are, are two primary ways that, that we gather information, that we choose to embrace knowledge, um, and I believe that Christianity offers a third. And that's what we looked at briefly last week, um, and particularly as it relates to, to the scriptures. Um, those, uh, those three areas, one of them we would call rationalism, which has to do with truth being what we can figure out logically with our minds, truth being what makes sense to us. A uh, second way is what we call empiricism, and that would say that truth is what we can observe and understand with our senses, what we can see, what we can hear, what we can, can examine and test. Christianity offers a third, and that's what we call revelation. And it starts with the belief that there is a God, the God who created us is a God who speaks, a God who communicates. And he has communicated intentionally in the world that he has created. He communicates intentionally through the, the rational thought processes of the human mind, but he also has communicated verbally. And we may not fully understand how that has happened, but, but the Bible, which is the, the foundation of our, our faith, is, is a key part of that revelation. It's not the only part, but the Bible is a, is a record of some of the, what we would call verbal revelations of God, how he would, would speak to people in the past in different ways and speak through them and communicate his truth. Again, Christianity would suggest that the God who spoke this universe into existence, the God who made mankind in his image with the capacity to think and reason, the God who gave mankind the ability to hear and to see and taste and touch and examine and experiment upon all the world that's around us, that this God is a God who speaks. We started also last week looking at the question of how are we to understand the relationship between pursuing truth with our minds, pursuing truth with, with experimentation, with our senses, what we see and hear, and what, what the Christian faith would call us to, just receiving truth as a gift from God. How do we harmonize all of that? <laughs> we talked about how that there are some who, who would accept one and, and reject the others. There are certainly those who would say it's all rationalism, or it's all empiricism, or those who would say it's, it's only what the Bible says and, and we don't trust the rest. And, and a suggestion I made last week that, that is kind of part of, um, part of our brethren heritage is that not only do we embrace revelation and believe that this somehow has come to us from God, but we embrace conversation. We embrace the fact that the Bible is, in a sense, a conversation with itself and, and that we don't just pick out a verse here and a verse there and make it mean whatever we say it means. But we need to understand and explore the nature of that conversation and let the Bible interpret itself. And, and we need to be diligent about, about studying and seeking to understand and to interpret it rightly as it, as it interprets itself. We talked about how part of that conversation is God speaking to us through his spirit. Another part of that conversation is how we speak to one another. 
and how we discern together as we, as we study the scriptures, as we listen to God's voice in the world around us. And yes, we understand that, that part of that conversation is a conversation between the revelation verbally and the revelation through the rational processes of our mind, revelation through the science that's around us. Let me just, just give a couple examples of how I believe that that can work harmoniously. Ecclesiastes 1.5 says, The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. Is that what happens? Does the sun come up in the east and it sets in the west? And then does it go back real fast to the east so it can rise again the next morning? Okay, so do we, have, do we have a dilemma there? Do we say, okay, well, but the Bible says, or do we say, well, no, we've understood, we've learned some things about how God has revealed himself in nature that doesn't work that way. And then maybe we come to say, well, does that mean that the Bible's wrong? Or maybe we let the Bible interpret what it means and we come to understand that it's not just picking a verse out, but, but we understand that the Bible often is speaking from the perspective of what we see with the natural eye. And is it any less true that there's a sense in which that is our experience? That the sun rises and sets and the next morning there it is again? Is that something we can marvel at? <laughs> Is that something that can lead us to worship God? Is that not true? Well, in a sense, it, it is true, isn't it? It just so happens that from our perspective, it doesn't go backwards. It comes all the way around. And of course, then if you get particular, it doesn't do that at all. <laughs> We're the ones who are moving. It's perception. And it's okay to address things, to talk about human experience from perception. Another example would be scriptures which talk about the four corners of the earth. There was a time when the consensus was that the earth was flat. We know different now. Does that mean that the Bible's wrong? It's an expression. But yes, if we don't allow that conversation to happen... We can, we can get ourselves involved in some battles that really aren't worth fighting. Now, it's not the point this morning to talk about evolution. But that probably comes up and says, well, how do we reconcile that? And there are people who will reconcile that. There are people who say that, that a reading of Genesis chapter 1 can certainly be a reading that would allow for for a, a poetic sense or allow that when it talks about on this day and on this day, well, maybe each day is an age of time. And, and that's a possibility. My biggest concern with evolution is not because I think it can't possibly be harmonized with the scripture. It's because I think it's too weak to satisfy me. <laughs> that it takes more faith for me to believe in what I've seen and heard from that than it does a record of a God who created by speaking a word. But that's a subject for another time. The point this morning is to, is to help us begin to understand this interplay between the logical, rational processes of, of our mind as God created us and, and the, the desire to, to prove things by seeing and touching and hearing and yet God often asking us to believe things, to take things he's revealed to us, and to take it by faith. There are scriptures which say we don't walk by what we see, we walk, we live by what we, by believing. And it's not necessarily always either or, it's, it's there's this dance between the three. And God created us with minds that want to try to sort things out and make sense of things. He created us with with ability to, to, to prove and to verify by what we see and hear and experience. But the caution of his scripture is to, is to recognize that even our interpretation of what we see is limited in its reliability. 
Even our, even our ability to rationally figure things out is limited and that the caution of Scripture, as we looked last week in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. doesn't say abandon it. It says don't lean on it entirely. Kind of submit ourselves to God. Walk humbly with Him. Recognize the limits of human rationality, the limits of, of human ability to, to see and to, to experiment on everything in the universe and to think we know it all. No, submit all of that to God. Start our considerations with Him. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and let Him direct your paths. And what's fascinating, and we find out as we look at Scripture, and, and we're going to see just a little bit of it, of it today in, in this next step, is that when, when our hearts are, are open to God, when we take that step of faith, it's, it's amazing how, how once, we, once we've opened our heart and mind to Him, how, how these other areas seem to fall in place. It's amazing how, how when we are really pursuing God, with heart, mind, soul, and strength, how, how life makes sense to the satisfaction of our logic and our rational capacities. C.S. Lewis, we're studying his book, Mere Christianity, in our library Sunday school class. One of my favorite quotes of his is, I believe in Christianity like I believe in the sun. And I'm not getting it word for word here. Um, not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. Think about that for a moment. I believe in Christianity like I believe in the sun, not just because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. It's like once we take the step of faith that other things fall into place and make sense in ways that they never did before. And we have a better ability to interpret things that we see and things that we hear and things we experience. They also, we find how that fits together. There's another caution in Scripture. It's not just a caution about, about giving too much authority to the evidences or to our own mind and ability to understand. You know, there's a caution about giving too much Consideration to Scripture. Now you got to hear this out. Jesus said these words in John 5, talking to the Pharisees. Chapter, chapter 5, verses 39 to 40. You study the Scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. Isn't that true? What's wrong with that? And yet Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. But listen to his next statement. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. It is possible to make an, I an idol of the scriptures that we elevate above Christ. It gets tricky. I understand that. But we need to recognize that, that the whole point in God giving revelation verbally in his word is to culminate in Christ. And we talk about the center of the Christian faith. It ultimately centers, yes, this is a record and this is, this is a guide. This is, this is revelation that we would not have known just from creation and from other sources. We needed God's verbal revelation but the point of it is to lead us to Christ. And that's where we come this morning as we look to the scriptures, yes, but through the scriptures to see Jesus himself. So I want us to turn back to our bulletin and I, I want us to think about these scriptures that we've, we've already read this morning that talk about Christ and how Christ is the center, central focus. And I want us to think as we read through each of these, and, and I'm not going to ask you to read them out loud, but I want you to follow as I read them. I want you to think whether the focus here is on revelation 
In other words, God speaking verbally, perhaps. God expressing his, his character, um, whether the emphasis is on rational thought processes or whether the emphasis is on tasting, touching, experiencing, <coughs> empiricism, as it is called. Let's think about the first one from, from Hebrews, where the writer says, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. Is that primarily empiricism? Rationalism or revelation? I'd say revelation. That's God actually speaking somehow uh, in, in words, giving understanding, giving truth. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Interesting. Jesus, ultimate revelation of God. He has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. Now there's a verse that's not in your bulletin, the very next verse. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. He says the Son is exactly like the Father. The Son is a revelation. The Son is, is showing us what God is like. So there's a strong emphasis here on God revealing himself to us in the past, often through words, and now in a new way, through his son. And I think that that's kind of the essence of the Christian faith is that we see all of the scriptures culminating in Jesus Christ and Jesus being kind of the final word, the authoritative word, the, the fullest and most complete word, expression of who God is, expression of God revealing himself to us. Certainly some overlap in John chapter 1, but here it gets a little more, um, oh, you fill in the word. John, John's a fascinating gospel writer, but he's very different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, John was a philosopher. <laughs> And it, it kind of shows here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. And if I had to choose between revelation, rationalism, empiricism, I would say this is the rationalism part. I don't mean rationalizing, making excuses. That's a whole different meaning of the term. Here's John, who's marveling at this creator God who has entered our universe. And we, we get a sense that John is writing and he's just, he's mulling this over in his mind and he's writing in, in kind of this deep, profound way. Trying to piece it all together. And, and, and for John, this has come to make sense. And he's, he's making connections and he's tracing it all. And he says, it, it fits. This is the word. This is, this is the word in flesh. This is the word who created the universe and has now come into the universe. And it's just, it's marvelous and it's mysterious. And it's fascinating. And it makes sense to me. But the same John then went on in that same chapter to write, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. The glory is of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Boy, here you kind of have all three of them mixed up in one word in one verse. Yeah, there's this sense about how the son reveals the father. How the son, Jesus, shows us exactly what God is like, full of grace, full of truth. He's also still in this marveling, mysterious, rational uh, frame of mind where he's putting it all together in deep and profound ways. But this first statement, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. All of a sudden, there's something tangible. All of a sudden, this isn't just God speaking through words. It's not just God 
maybe guiding our thought processes as we try to figure it all out, but, but now all of a sudden, this is God in flesh and bones. This is God who can be touched, literally, physically. This is God who has been seen with the human eyes. This is God whose voice has been heard with the human ear. All of a sudden, this is God under a microscope of humanity. And later on in his first letter, John would lift up this part of it. And again, in your bulletins, it kind of sounds like his gospel. This which was from the beginning. Well, what was from the beginning? Well, the word. He had no beginning. The word always was. He was with God as he wrote earlier. This which was from the beginning, which we have what? Heard. Which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. This is God who's come into our world in the person of Christ. In a sense, has proven himself. Now, there's, there's a lot more that we can talk about in this regard. We can look at so many stories in the Gospels and encounters where, where Jesus called people to believe in him and to trust and and there are times when he, he emphasis, emphasizes his, his oneness with the Father and how he reveals the Father. There are times when, when he's talking more rationally and trying to help us make sense of it all. There are times when he says, if you don't believe what I'm saying, at least believe the works that I've done. Believe the miracles. See them. They, they're screaming out too. Screaming out the truth of, of who I am and what I've, what I've done. If you don't believe anything else, believe the works themselves so that you'll come to understand. And that by looking at this empirical evidence, at least, let that draw you to me and to the ultimate conclusion that I am the Messiah, that I am the Son of God, that I am here to bring salvation to the world. It makes me think of a familiar incident that happened after the resurrection. Remember one of the disciples was absent when Jesus appeared to the others. You remember which one? Thomas. And when they reported and said, we've seen him. And what did he say? Unless I can put my fingers in the nail prints and thrust my hand into the wound of his side, I will not <laughs> Believe. What was he looking for? To make rational sense of it? Was he looking for a new word from God? No, he was looking for tangible proof. And the time came when Thomas was there and Christ came. He said, Thomas, come touch. Don't be doubting, but believe. He said that Thomas came and he, he fell on his feet, a face. He fell before him and said, said, my Lord and my God. Jesus said, Thomas, you have seen and believe. How blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. There's an interplay. God created us as we are with the curiosity that we have. I believe when, when we open our hearts and minds to accept the truth as it's been revealed, I believe he also opens our hearts and minds to be able to see the evidence around us. To be able to see the evidence that the world has created, to be able to see the evidence in the lives of other people whose lives have been transformed through faith in Christ. And it all comes and it makes sense. So that there is no conflict between faith and reason. 
and science. It comes together in a way that strengthens strengthens our faith, strengthens our, our confidence in a God who created and a Christ who came and walked among us. So another question that I haven't even touched on too much, and that's okay. So God speaks, and he spoke through his son. Okay, I get that. Last week, God speaks. This week, his ultimate revelation is through Jesus Christ, his son. Well, what did he say? What was the message of Christ? Well, we're going to talk about that next week. I'll just whet your appetite a little bit. We talked about how, how all of Christianity is kind of like this great, great building, this great house, and there's this hallway, which is kind of what we all share in common, and then there are individual rooms, which are different strands of different traditions, different, different stories of, of, of the brethren or of, of the Catholic Church or of, of uh, the Lutheran Church. Each, each have kind of their own story. Well, some of those stories emphasize the message as being saving mankind for eternity. Is that the essence? Is that the whole of what Jesus' message, what he came to reveal? Well, that's a pretty important part of it. <clears throat> but I think we miss something if that's all that we see. But Christ also came to give, to give hope, to give healing to give transformation, to give freedom from chains. God, God revealed himself in his son, not only for heaven, but for here and now. And some traditions emphasize one, some the other. I think it's another case where it's a both end. And uh, hopefully we can, can look at that and understand that a little more clearly uh, next Sunday and as we as we culminate the day then in our, in our love feast and communion, um, I think these concepts come together pretty, pretty beautifully in that service as, as we see all of those things addressed um, as, we, as we see Christ through the bread, through the cup, through the, the washing of feet, through the fellowship meal. And um, I hope you can come and, and be with us next week.